We are unequivocal that it is the love of Christ that brings us together. Today and always, we declare him to be our Savior and our Redeemer, the Bishop and the Shepherd of our souls, our great High Priest. We bear witness with every sermon he ever preached, every prayer that he ever uttered, every miracle he ever called down, and every redeeming act that he ever performed. We believe that he died for the sins, the sorrows, and the sicknesses of us all. From Adam unto the end of the world, Christ died and rose again. Amen? Do you all hear that echo? <laughs> it's different up here, I can tell you that. If you have your Bibles with me, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah, the first chapter of the book of Jonah. Today we're going to follow the journey of a prophet who got out of God's will and went down three times because of it. A prophet who got out of God's will and then went down three times because of it. Everybody say, three times. The prophet Jonah had heard this call before. It was not unusual for God to speak so loudly and so often to this prophet, his trusted man. Surely no man's heart had beaten with such intensity. He didn't want to do this that God was calling him to do. As a matter of fact, the ground beneath his very feet was dampened as t tears poured through his beard. This time was different. He had served God before, but this time he believed that God had gotten it wrong. And he would rather die than do as he was told. And so clenching his fist and turning his back, he fled the sloping hills of southern Galilee, hoping that the sound of the change in his pocket would both sear his conscience and quieten the call. Jonah was a man on the run, but he wouldn't get very far. You see, for us today, it's, it's not an uncommon thing for the child of God to get down and out about God's will. Sometimes you're not going to want to go where God's called you to go. Sometimes within yourself, you're not going to want to do what God has called you to do and minister to the people that God has called you to minister to. Have you ever felt that dread? When you knew God was saying, pay for the person behind you in Arby's. When you knew that God was saying, go speak to that random person in Ingalls and tell them Jesus loves you. Or if you knew that you were being called to be a missionary. You knew you were being called to teach or to volunteer for vacation Bible school. Whatever it was. Oh, the heaviness of the dread that sets in, the burden of that call on your life, the thunderous, vociferous voice of the Lord as it pounds against your heart again and again, and it says, go. Too often we say, no, I won't go. I'll do anything else but that. And that is where we must be careful, my friends, because these are the kinds of words that echo into the very chambers of Satan. And he wants to take you down down, down. He will tell you that it's easier and more convenient for you to just try to run away or for you to try to find another activity to take your mind off of what God is calling you to do. He'll tell you that it's going to be a safe adventure for you to get onto a ship and head away in another direction. With a, a, a storm you're sailing into, the ship is not designed to withstand the storm that's coming for the disobedient child of God with sailors who are bound to cast you into the sea at the first opportunity. Be warned. Those who get up and run away will slowly begin a downward spiral. How do we know this? Jonah went down three times. We're going to read that today. The first time he went down, the Bible says he went down to Joppa. He went down to Joppa. Let me tell you something about Joppa. I've been there. It's pretty cool. Um, spiritually and physically. And we're going to talk about that first one. He went down to Joppa, which is really modern-day Tel Aviv. And if you've ever been to this place, it's right on the Mediterranean Sea. People like to go vacation there. It was a nice place. It was kind of maybe sort of a little bit like the Las Vegas or the Panama City Beach, where I just need to, get some, I just need to clear my mind. I think God's calling me. No, he knew God was calling him. I think God's calling me to do something. I think I'm going to go on a deep-sea fishing trip, Wes, this place. <laughs> Amen. So he goes down to Joppa, a place that he should have never been. 
Second, he goes down into the ship. We're going to talk about the importance of that. And number three, he goes down into the sea. And so just like Jonah, you have a choice to make today about which way you want to go. Towards God and all that he's calling you to do and everything uh, that you're destined and purposed for in your life, you run towards that. Or you can try to go in the other direction. Some of us in the house this morning are already going that way. Notice, if you know this story, it took a long time for the clouds to come and the waves to increase. Jonah thought he was going to be just fine. Jonah thought that he could get away from God's call. Listen to this. Nineveh, the place that Jonah was being called to go and minister to, was a bad place. But it was the perfect place for Jonah. I expect all y'all to quote that on your Instagram. Everybody better be listening up here too. Nineveh was a bad place, but it was the perfect place for Jonah. And it was where he needed to be. I want to ask you today, are you where you need to be? The title of this morning's message is an unwelcome invitation. Y'all get that? An unwelcome invitation. Why it's important to go to Nineveh even though there's a ship heading for Tarshish. Would you please stand as we read the Lord's Word together? In Jonah chapter 1, we're going to be skipping around a little bit uh, right to the very end. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. He got up and out of God's will right there. From the presence of the Lord, and this is the first time he went down, he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. And he paid the fare thereof, and he went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. When the mariners, they were afraid and, and cried every man unto his God and began to cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay there and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise and call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us and we perish not. When ev they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots so that we can find out what cause this evil is upon us. And they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What's your occupation? Where do you come from? Why, what is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I'm a Hebrew. Listen, when you run away from God, and you go down to Joppa, and you get down in the ship, and the situation that you brought on yourself and other people begins to get dastardly and tempestuous, not only are people going to find out that you've been called by God, it's going to affect your testimony. And he said unto them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. In verse 10, Then were the man exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why have you done this? I believe that's a question the world's asking the Christian church today. For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm for us? The sea was wrought and was tempestuous. Verse 12. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. He didn't say, Let's pray. He didn't say, Turn this ship around right now and that'll make things better. He said, No, just toss me out into this literal storm in the midst of the Mediterranean Sea because I would still rather die than go back to Nineveh. Unrepentant. But at least I've got a heart enough to stop the situation from affecting you. And so he says, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm for you. For I know that for my sake, 
this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. But they could not, for the sea was wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord, unto the true God, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. In verse 15, so they took up Jonah, and they cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased her raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. And now verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. I want you to notice the contrast there before we pray. Notice the contrast as soon as they got rid of the Jonah that was on board their ship that was holding them back and bringing hard times onto their lives. As soon as they got rid of it, everything was fine above the, above the water. But for Jonah, as he began to sink through the watery, black, darky, inky abyss, which was the Mediterranean in, in a storm... Things were not well. But out of the mercy of God, in his drowning, in his attempt to perhaps even take his own life through drowning, God had prepared a great fish to swallow him up. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Oh, what a picture of our Lord and the resurrection that would be to come. Heavenly Father, may you bless the reading of your word. May you bless our ears and our hearts as we receive your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can be seated. I want to go over three points with you today. Three points that I believe that the Lord has highlighted through studying this week. And the first point is the convenience of Joppa. Can y'all repeat that? The convenience of Joppa. You see, on the journey outside of God's will, it's going to be easy to get lost in a place like Joppa. There's going to be lots of friends there, and there's going to be a lot of, of trinkets there. There's going to be a lot of people and places and things to do that are going to be there to distract you from what you really need to be doing. How many of y'all have ever said to yourself, well, I really need to be doing my taxes. I really need to take the car to get an oil change. I really need to be helping my kid with the homework, but I'm over here because I'm watching my favorite show. And, and, and you start, if, it, it, as soon as there's an opportunity to not do the thing that you know you should be doing, we're presented with something that doesn't mean nothing, but we'd rather do that than the thing that we need to do. You know what I'm talking about? Say amen if you do. Notice this. Not only is Joppa a convenient place where you can get everything you think you need, in a place like Joppa, you'll always have enough money, just enough, to board a ship heading the other way. Jonah had left the southern hills of Galilee, and he'd crossed the top and went to Joppa. And the change in his pocket, it was burning a hole. And he, he just needed to find one thing that could take him as far away from the call of God. And that was a ship. It was heading for modern-day Spain. Nobody had been past there before that we know of in that part of the world. And so he was trying to get as far away from God as he possibly could. Notice this. When you go to a place like Joppa, that is to say God's called you to do something, you're running away getting distracted, not only are you now distracted and a Christian, but you are also a Christian who has uh, given everything they've got in the sin that they are in. Listen, there are no discounts for the disobedient. Joppa will drain you in every way possible. It'll drain you spiritually. It'll drain you mentally. It'll drain you in every possible way. It'll take something from you. It'll cost you. Little did Jonah realize that the worst place that he could have been was Joppa. He thought the worst place he could have been was Nineveh. But his ways are higher than ours, and he knows best, and we don't. And we need to listen to God because he loves us. Joppa is no place for the believer. You know what you're going to find in Joppa? In a place like Joppa, you will find no rest. You will find no friends, no true friends. We see the prodigal son, he kind of went to a little spiritual joppa too. And he found that when his money ran out, he didn't have no real friends. He didn't have nowhere to stay. He didn't have nobody to 
pat his head and shake his hand. He didn't have nobody. They had all left him. It drained him in every single way. There are no discounts for the disobedient. You'll find no forgetfulness in Joppa. You think you can escape this place that you're running away uh, from, but while you're there, it'll be all you can think about and you will lose your joy. There are some places that you were never meant to go. And just because you can get there doesn't mean that you need to go there. Amen? There are some things that you could do today that you don't need to do. There are some things that you could go out of this church right now today and go right back into old sinful, wicked habits that are destroying your life and your family, destroying your marriage, and you know it. Just because you can go there doesn't mean you should go there because the grace of Jesus Christ is able to rescue you from right where you are. Oh, praise the Lord for a set-free Christian. All you've got to do is turn around, look up, and say, Lord, bring me back up to where I need to be. And He'll do it for you. Listen to this. When you start running away from God, we talked about how it starts to, you start to go down. There, there, uh, when you start running away from God, you'll begin to notice that you're going down to some places that you didn't think you were capable of going down to before. How many of y'all know that when you are at living, and you know it, outside of the will of God? You're living outside of the will of God, you know it, you still do it. You're all in this boat with me. And uh, you, you ever notice that when you're outside of the will of God, it's kind of just like everything goes. And things just start coming into your life. You said, I'd have never smoked a joint. I'd have never abused prescription pills. I would have never found myself on the side of the road trying to pick somebody up. That's for them. We're, we're so prideful in our own selves, aren't we? But when we get outside of the will of God, when, when we are running away from Him, it is so easy in a place like Joppa, where we're running to, to find exactly what we need, and it'll leave you so empty. And listen to this. Not only are you capable of going down to some new things, that when you are on the run, you begin uh, open yourself to, to, to go down to some places that you've already been delivered from. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, how easy it is after a long, hard week at camp to go home and... This isn't me. I'm just giving an example. To go home and just say, well, I just today feels like a day that I just want to go back to that old same sin. It'll give me a little, give me a little uh, uh, relief from all this uh, tiredness. And uh, oh, it'll, you know, when we're tired and when we're hungry, when we're angry, all those things, we do things we wouldn't normally do. But it is when you are running away from God and you are trying to escape His will for your life that you are going to find yourself going back down to some places that you've done been delivered from, that you've done been brought out of. You know why? Because, man, it's easy in a place like Joppa to find exactly what you used to do in times like that. Amen? Miss Julie, could you bring me my ice cream? Thank you. She ate this whole thing before we came in here. <laughs> There's an old Eskimo trick that the, these these hunters up in Esco, the, in Eskimo, these hunters up there in Eskimo, Chad, they uh, they're real smart up there in the, you know. Well, anyway, they take a big Bowie knife. This is ingenious. It's almost too good. He should have done this in turkey season. He'd have got another one. Praise the Lord. Okay, so they take this buoy knife, and, and, and you know what they do? It's so cold up there, they start dipping it in seal blood. They dip it in seal blood, and then they freeze it. And then they dip it in seal blood again, and they freeze it. They repeat this process until the blade of the buoy knife isn't even visible at all. And they keep doing it. I, I, I remember this because I had pop, every time I come to this church, I get a popsicle. Y'all need to pray for me. Get those popsicles out of here. And, and we, we keep dipping it in seal blood until around the blade of the knife there is a very tasty treat for a wolf. And they want the wolf. They'll use the wolf in every possible way. And then instead of shooting it, they'll just leave these around up there in the cold. And so they'll take this blood popsicle and they'll jam it into the snow and they'll go stand behind a tree and wait. Because guess what? They can smell blood. 
especially when it starts to melt a little. And you know, so the wolf will come and he'll see this wonderful treat. Oh, I don't even have to kill the seal today. I can just have this nice, wonderful, wonderful treat. I don't know where it came from, but I'm dumb, and so I'm just going to go ahead and dig in. And so the wolf begins enjoying his treat and licking and enjoying and, and tasting and all of these things. And slowly but surely, the blood from the seal is so prevalent in his taste buds. It's so prevalent, it's all over. He can't see that inside of that blood popsicle there is a blade. And it's already begun to cut the roof of his mouth. But he's enjoying it so much he can't feel it. As a matter of fact, the coldness of the seal blood has numbed his mouth. And the tip of the blade is already beginning to cutting in. He can't tell his own blood from the seal blood. And before long, yeah, he's had a, a tasty treat and he's enjoyed it. But it's cost him his life and he didn't even know it. Running away from God, living a life of sin, man, it sure does taste good at first, doesn't it? Oh, I don't want to do that. I would rather do this. So I'm going to do that. You think you're fine. Jonah was fine. He had enough money to get on the ship. It felt like God's will. Maybe it is God's will I should be doing this. I'm going to get on this ship and run away. But no storm clouds inside. I guess God still loves me and everything's fine. I'm just ignoring the call of God in my life. Man, how sin is so deceptive. And how when you begin to taste that sin in your life, the running away and all of these things you know are wicked and should not be in your life, after a while, it's going to start to cut you. It's going to numb you. It's a slow fade into this running away process. It starts with getting your change out of the dresser to see if you've got enough money for the boat. And then the next step is, well, hiking it on down to, to Joppa. And then after that, well, you find what you need there, and you start looking around, you find a ship, and before long, you've lied to yourself and deceived yourself, and you're in a heap of trouble. Because the tip of the blade has already started to cut into you and you didn't even see it. You didn't even know it. Oh, it tastes so good. And you are getting weaker by the second. Can I get an amen? When you've turned your back on God, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like you've begun to indulge your own ways. Your own ways will cut you and they'll hurt you. That's why we've got to stay in the realm of God's way. And his path for our life. We need to understand that there will always be a Joppa to run to. There will always be another boat heading in the other direction. And there will always be one more seat on the boat. My question to you for this first point is, what is your Joppa? What is the thing in your life that incessantly and constantly pulls you away from church? God's been convicting you for a long time about being more faithful to attend church. God's been talking to you about being more faithful to pray and not just when somebody's in the emergency room and not just when somebody's had a wreck on the side of the highway and not just when you say your prayers with your children at bedtime. Those are all three great things and you should be spiritually mature enough to understand that those have a place, but the real work happens in the prayer closet. Do you know that today? It's true. What is your joppa? What is pulling you away from your family? You've been called to be the head of your household. You've been called to be a father. You've been called to be a mother. You've been called to, to serve and, and love and train up these children and spend time with them. But every time we want to get called to do that, we'll just take off real quick and hit, and hit the road. Are you all with me? What is that thing, what's the Holy Spirit speaking into your heart right now? The thing that you're always running to when you should be running the other way. Point number one, the convenience of Joppa. Point number two, the comfort of the ship. The comfort of the ship. Oh, how easy it is for us to develop a false sense of security while we're going down, down, down. Take note of this. When Jonah went into the ship, there was no indicator of any storm. There was no impending bad weather. There was no particular reason why Jonah should have felt particularly 
upset or worried about where he was. But listen to this. The Bible says that when he got on the ship, he went down into it and he started to take a nap. So even though he didn't know it, on the outside, a storm was brewing. On the inside of a ship, he was asleep. On the outside, a storm was brewing. And on the inside, he had fallen asleep. Question. Are you spiritually asleep today? Are you saved and bought with a price? Have blood of Jesus been shed and poured over you? Are, you? are you a saved, baptized Christian today? But you're just asleep. Man, you know you've got a call for God on your life, but you're just too busy. You just don't have time for these things that God's calling you to do. And you'll get to them in, uh, at another time or down the road. Or, or, or you'll just keep lying to yourself and say, I, God didn't really say that. He loves me, grace, 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 all this stuff. Yeah, he does love you. And there is grace. But we also don't run away from the Lord God Almighty and get away. Amen? And we're going to see what God does for us who run. Listen to this. We've got a lot of Christians today who have been called by God. They know it. They're refusing to walk in their calling. They're setting sail on a ship heading the other way. And all the while, in the midst of their running, think of the consequences. The Ninevites that they have been called to, a wicked people who had done terrible things and needed the Lord. And God, in His wonderful, sovereign grace, decides that He's going to do something special for the Ninevites. And that's up to Him and not Jonah. But all the while Jonah is running away, these Ninevites are being swept off the boat. They're being swept away in their sin. And it's time to wake up. There's a class you need to teach. There's a small group you need to be a part of. There's a family that you've been placed in that you need to be uh, more loving to, less angry at. There are your Ninevites. And if you don't wake up, it's going to be too late. Listen, maybe the reason you're going under today is because you have a Jonah on board and you have failed to remove him and bring him to the surface and cast him out. Do you have a Jonah on board today? Maybe on board your ship, you're not running away from God. It just so happens that your problem today, where you are at spiritually, you've got a Jonah on board. He shouldn't be in your life. But you have allowed him to stay there. You've allowed him to grow. You've even fed him there. You've let him be comfortable in that area. What are we talking about, Pastor Trey? You know what the Holy Spirit's talking to you about right now. Maybe the reason you're going under today, maybe the reason your life is always falling apart, well, yeah, you're under attack from an enemy, but maybe you're, you have a Jonah on board, and the, you, hey, the storm's going to stop, and your life's going to get right if you will listen to the Lord, bring him up to the surface, deal with it by the power of the Holy Spirit, and cast him out. Amen? When I was in the fifth grade, which was 2005, okay, just so everybody's understanding, it really was. Don't laugh. 2005, I was at Hayesville Middle School. I was in the fifth grade in North Carolina. Fifth grade is middle school. And uh, we were getting ready for our end of grade test. Okay? And we were getting ready for our end of grade test. And so they gave us these little test booklets that if you felt the paper, it would make you scream. It just, oh, that paper. And they, they had these pencils, too, that uh, were from Ticonderoga, Tennessee, or whatever. And uh, any time you'd try to erase a mark, you know, it'd make it worse. Do y'all have those pencils too? The terrible erasers. And it was a gray pencil. I'll never forget it. And uh, maybe it was Shelbyville, Tennessee. But anyway, I was sitting there in my seat. Let, let me see if I can sit down here for a minute. I was sitting there in my seat, and I was kind of nervous. And so I, I had a little nervous tick. And I, I was just kind of hitting my knee. I was just kind of hitting the side of my leg. It's really hard. Because this fifth grade, this was middle school testing. North Carolina was supposed to be tough. So I was kind of nervous. Well, I went to write something down in my test booklet. And sure as the world, I forgot to turn the pencil back over. And so I came down on my leg with the full force of my middle school fighting, wrestling arm. I came down with the full strength of my arm, 
just like that with the tip of that pencil. Bubba, it's true. It's true, Bubba. And here's the thing. It hurt, number one. I'll never forget going to the bathroom. And it was bleeding. And uh, I got a little paper towel out of the thing. And there wasn't no touch screens yet. You had to, like, pump them out. And uh, so I began to dab up the blood and everything. A few days later, I looked at it, and it was starting to heal. It was bruised and all this. And over time, it was revealed to me that I had a large chunk of lead stuck in my leg. Do you know that this was, I'm not good at math, 10, 15, 17 years ago? Oh, man. Whoa. 17 years ago, Wes, don't count that. He knows everything. 17 years ago, I've still got that same piece of lead in my leg, and if we push the leg hair aside, we can see it, okay? It's still in there. You know, I've, I've used this sermon illustration, what I'm doing right now, back a year ago or something, told the same story and tried to share and use it to help people and help present a truth. And so, you know how long it's been since I've thought about the lead that's in my leg? I walk with it every day. I, 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 use, I use these legs every day. It's been a year since I've thought about the lead that's in my leg. And so why have I told you this story? Here's the reason. You may not always see the things in your life or feel the things in your life that are bringing you down, that are present inside of you spiritually that, are, that should not be there. But they are present and they are actively working against you whether you realize it or not. And it is time to extract them before they do any more damage to God's kingdom, to God's purpose for your life. And your testimony. Amen? What has the devil, what has the world, what has other people implanted inside of you, your childhood, your teenage years, even recently, that's a seed of bitterness? It's, it's in there. And it shouldn't be there. This sin, this sin of, uh, you know, inappropriate things and, and sexual immorality, this thing that's, that's been put inside of you. And, and hey, listen, it's bringing you down. Down, down, down. We must, some of, that scared some of y'all, and I like it. It's time to confront the Jonas in your life, amen? The things on your ship that are bringing you down that shouldn't be there. My question for you on point number two is, what has fallen asleep inside of you that you need to bring to the surface and throw overboard once and for all? And so, not only what is your joppa, the thing you run to. What's the, what, what's the thing you're stuck in? What's the thing that you've fallen, fallen asleep on that you need to wake up and get out? And so the convenience of Joppa and the comfort of the ship. Point number three and last point. The cost of being swallowed whole. The cost of being swallowed whole. When you start going down and you get a little bit deeper, and the thing that you have failed to remove from your heart is still there. And it begins to take you under. Many times God has to do something drastic in order to restore you. I need you all to hang with me because this is full circle and it's going to change your life. Many times God has to do something drastic in order to restore you. What do I mean by that? Sometimes... You must hit rock bottom before you can be brought back up. That's a lot of people, isn't it? Have you ever been there before? How many of y'all have hit rock bottom? Just be honest. Man, you hit rock bottom. And it helped you. It got you back up on your feet again. Listen, sometimes God uses those situations to restore us in a powerful, marvelous way by His grace. And there's an example of this in the Scripture. I don't know why I'm holding this right now, but I'm just going to keep holding it. The example of this hitting rock bottom thing that I brought up is in the prodigal son. He had everything he needed. He was happy and healthy. Uh, he was a little arrogant and selfish, and so he took everything and went off, squandered it, 
And then, once he lost all his money, he just decided, I'd rather, I'd rather uh, sleep with the pigs and eat with the pigs than go back. Or I'd rather keep living on the streets. Or I'd rather not have any access to my family and friends. I'd rather just stay on drugs. I'd rather just keep doing this until they keep saying that, until they are so far gone. They are so far down. They've hit rock bottom. There's no other place to go but up. And that's where God can really get you. Amen? And take you where you need to be. Many times God has to do something drastic in order to restore you. I want to set the context for just a minute. Now the sailors who were with Jonah, they have been saved and they're probably on their way. Blue skies, as Willie says. Okay, somebody didn't get that, that's okay. (laughs) Jonah is still beneath the inky black darkness of the Mediterranean Sea. And not only that, Leela... He's been swallowed by a whale. I want a a, a big fish. Let me say this. We've seen these cartoons, and and we know that the, the, the media, the cartoons, and even Christian cartoons, they like to portray Jonah in this happy little cave up in Jonah, up in the whale's stomach, and, and he's got him a little old-timey like candle, and he's got him a TV or something too, and it's just a big tongue in there, and he's got a big cave, and he's just kind of sitting there thinking, well, should I pray or not? Let me tell you what this would have really been like. It would have not been comfortable at all. Imagine getting swallowed by a whale and having to slither right through their their stomach and all their innards and get into that stomach. It would have been a tight squeeze. It's a miracle that he would have even been able to breathe in there. The gastric juices of the whale's stomach would have already begun to bleach his skin and pull his hair out. It would have been a very painful experience. It would have been a very tight experience. And so they're on their way, but Jonah is suffering. In Jonah chapter 2, I encourage you to read it. That's his prayer. Jonah chapter 3, that's where he goes and answers the call, preaches to Nineveh. And Jonah chapter 4, man, I had my student leadership team read that the other day. It's the weirdest chapter in the Bible. Man, that's weird. You got to go read it today. Many times God has to do something drastic in order to restore you. And sometimes we must be placed in these unfamiliar, uncomfortable situations that will change everything. Now, you're running from God today. Maybe you're just still in Joppa. Get back. Time, time to repent. Maybe, maybe you just spent everything you had, but you've, already, you've got on the boat. You need to get off of that boat, leave your money, and go back. Maybe you're on the ship today. Hey, get up and jump out of that ship. But if you're, if you're so far gone, you, man, you've hit rock bottom. And there's one here today. There's one. God has placed you in the only situation that can bring you back fully to Him. Not only bring you back fully, but bring you back better than you were when you came in. I'm going to prove that to you. I'm going to prove to you that sometimes being placed in these rock bottom, unfamiliar, uncomfortable situations will produce a new substance in you that was better than when you went in before. I drink a glass of tea every morning. Miss Julie, I'm ashamed that there's no, there's no sugar in here. Because I really was hoping to have a drink. But uh, my, the boys that went to camp with us, who were in my cabin... That's Bubba and Isaiah. Cooper was in there for a little while. We had Connor. We had Andy. What? And Grant Kelly. Grant Ballou. It was a wonderful time. They know, and if if you were with me in the morning, some of you didn't get to be with me in the mornings because I was driving too. But I have a a glass of hot tea every day. If not in the morning... In the evenings, and I go drive around Gates Chapel, and I roll my window down, and I say hello to the goats and the cows, and have a wonderful time, and stop at every church, and stop at the creek, and take pictures, and some of y'all have seen my pictures, and I love taking pictures, but I always do it with my glass of hot tea. So I want to prove something to you. This is a little carafe of water, hot water, boiling water that we boiled today. I want you to imagine that this is Jonah. Look over here at... Uh, I keep wanting to call you Phil, and I know your name's not Phil. What is it? Frank. Look over here at Frank's beard, okay, real quick. Imagine that this is Jonah. Think his face when I'm talking about this, okay? This is Jonah. Now, isn't that easier for you? Isn't that wonderful? Jonah didn't have no mustache. He had a big old beard just like that. And so imagine that this is Jonah, and and think about it. Hot water. Man, you can do a lot of things with hot water, Leela. Man, you could really get some stains out with some hot water. 
You could scare some people with hot water. You could burn, burn some people with hot water. Right? You could do a lot of things with hot water. Love hot water. In, even in your shower, hot water. Hot water will clean things up. Wash clothes. Wash your dishes. Hot water's good. Amen? I want you all to make sure you're staying with me. I'm about to prove something. It's going to be cool. And so, uh, we put Jonah into this situation. He, he's pretty comfortable here. Would have went to Nineveh right here and been kept being used by God as a prophet. God called him to do this job because he trusted him. Jonah comes up other times in the Bible outside of the book of Jonah. And it's a good, it's cool. You ought to go look that up too. It's pretty weird. God trusted him. And this would have been wonderful. But he, he chose to run away from God. And that's your choice. And so Jonah is thrown into the sea and put into the belly of the whale. And he goes into this situation clear and good and nice and happy. Actually, he was not very happy. <laughs> Terrifying experience. Worst experience of his life. And I want you to notice something. That when the water went in, it was perfectly clear. And it's already beginning to change color. The substance of this water is already changing. And so God has placed him in a hot situation. It's a situation that looks like it's the end. It's a situation that looks like it's punishment. It's a situation that looks like it's over. Jonah's went too far. God can't save him. And God puts him in that situation and gets him a little, little deeper. Y'all see that it's getting a little darker? Anna, is it getting a little darker out there? Mine turns almost black. This isn't my tea bag. I get mine imported from England. They're called PG tips, and they use the stems of the leaves too, and it's real weird. Y'all learned something about me. God puts you in this situation. I want you to look at that as, as I continue here. I want you to look at that T if you can see it. Being submerged in a situation like this will produce a different taste. One that is good for ministry. One that can salvage a broken testimony. Imagine Jonah after his prayer in chapter 2 where he repents and says he'll go. Imagine when he come out of the fish. Imagine that. Imagine this. When you come out of the fish, you won't lose the evidence of having been inside of the fish. He went in hot water, but he come out a glass of hot tea. And when God brings you out of your mess, when God brings you back up from rock bottom, it's going to be better than when he, you went in there to begin with. Is everybody with me? You are entirely changed when God brings you out of your mess. Listen to what Henry Ward Beecher said. Oh, how he must have looked when he entered Nineveh and began to preach a message of judgment. His skin bleached by the gastric juices of the whale's stomach. His hair dissolved off of his body. He was a man changed physically, but more importantly, he was changed spiritually. Amen? When they looked at Jonah, you see Jonah over here, when they looked at Jonah... They saw a man who had lost nearly everything. He had no money. His hometown and everybody that had trusted and respected him to be a prophet of God really didn't trust or respect him anymore. He just lost his reputation. He's already broken his testimony with a lot of guys on a ship he'll never see again. Going to spread the word that these God followers are so good. I mean, it looks like Jonas lost everything. But as he enters Nineveh, and they see a man whose skin is bleached, no hair on him, and he's got a story to tell. He's been to the bottom of the barrel, and he's come back up by the grace and mercy and power of God who has rescued him. Rescued him. When it was all gone, oh man, he was hurting for three days. Oh man, he had a crick in his neck as the stomach caused him to be in pain. Wow! It was over. It should have been done. But God had a plan. But God put him in the only situation that could bring him back. And it was, it was not really up to Jonah, was it? God foresaw everything that Jonah would say and do. God foresaw the exact moment that he would be cast into the sea. And God had already appointed a big fish to swallow him up. Even in the midst of his continued rebellion. And God does that to us sometimes. Man, oh man, if we don't turn back to him, it's going it's to be, be tight for a while. It, it's going to hurt. There are no discounts for disobedience. 
But when we come out of that situation, we see that God can turn our mess into a message. He can turn our test into a testimony. And sometimes after you get out of what you're going through, and after you get rescued by God, people are going to be able to look at you differently, and there's a new taste to your ministry. They'll, they'll decide in their own hearts not to run because of the example that you have set. Amen? They'll see somebody who's been in the belly of the big fish and lived to tell about it. Do you all see how that works? Yes? If you feel like you're going down today, you say, Pastor Trey, man, I feel, as a matter of fact, I didn't realize it until today, but I feel like I've been going down for a long time. Nobody's known about this depression that I've been battling. Nobody knows about these thoughts that I have. Nobody knows about this prescription pill battle that I'm in. I, I don't know what to do. I'm in such pain. I'm in such, tr I, I, I've hit rock bottom. I don't know what to do. If your faith has fallen asleep, if your testimony feels broken, if you're on the way down, if you've hit rock bottom, I declare that you are in prime position to be saved, set free, rescued, healed, delivered, lifted up, caught up with God, and put back better than you were when you came in because that's just how good God is. Amen. I declare that in Jesus' name. That if you are there today, it only goes up from here. If you are on the ship today, jump off and be refreshed by the waters of the goodness of God. If you are in Joppa and you've lost everything that you've got and you are just about to step out of this place and go back to the ways of the world, get yourself back to the house of God. He will heal you. He will deliver you. He'll set you free. Not because you're worthy in your own strength. Not because you had to make all those bad decisions and everybody should just go to rock bottom so you can be brought back better. But because the saving grace of Jesus Christ has placed you in the only situation that can bring you back to Him. Even when God stood there and listened to Jonah say, I'm not going to go. God was like, alright, we're going to rescue this guy. And he's going he's to make all these choices. I see that. I see, and here's where I'm going to rescue him. You know what I believe God's saying today? I believe he's saying for a lot of you, not just a few. I believe a lot of you. I believe God is saying in this exact moment with a message like this, with it being presented to people that needed to hear it. Guess what? Today's the day that God set aside to bring you up and bring you back and set you back up on your feet again and lift you back up to where you need to be with him and rescue you from your sin and your addiction. Have you asked God to rescue you? You'd like to be rescued, wouldn't you? You'd like to be set free. But you don't know what to do. Matter of fact, sometimes you get real confused because you kind of like your addiction sometimes. But then it, then it takes every piece of confidence that you have and, and all of your self-worth and, and it destroys you. And you hate it. God can rescue you today if you'll ask Him to. Have you asked him to? Jonah, in closing, he had to make a decision while he was in the belly of the well. Go read the rest of this book. It's, it's, half of it's good. And that last chapter, we'll have to talk about that. No, I'm just playing. It's good. It's a good one. As a matter of fact, they repent. Okay, I'll just go ahead and tell you. The Ninevites repent. God uses him, and it should have been a wonderful time. And... Uh, then he goes, sits underneath a gourd, and he gets depressed, and he curses God, and he's mad, and all this stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of a depressed minister, maybe. Jonah had to make a decision in the belly of that well, and he had to say, I will crawl out of this darkness. I, I, I do want to serve the Lord, and I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out of this thing, and I'm going to do what's right, and I need God's help. And so with the fervent power of prayer at work and God's majestic hands on his creature. He pushed Jonah up out of that well and onto the seashore by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ almost blinded by where he had been. He crawled up and he got himself on his feet and he dusted himself off and I bet it wasn't but just a few seconds before he knew exactly which direction he was going to run. The Holy Spirit said, head east, brother, or whichever way. 
And I want to ask you, and I want to ask you this, will you stay in the darkness of your rock bottom situation? Will you stay on the ship with the Jonah that you know should not be there? With the Jonah that the Holy Spirit has already discerned within your heart that you do not need to be sailing with, bring it to the surface and get it out. Will you stay in Joppa today? Man, we, we got most of our Christians in the city of Joppa where we're just halfway kind of straddling the fence. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21 says something like this. Uh, uh, Elijah says to the people on the top of Mount Carmel, which we've also been to, it's so cool. He said, how long will you stand between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If Baal, serve Baal. And, and really, this paints a picture of, 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 a, of a Christian straddling a fence. And saying, well, yes, I, I'm going to talk to my youth right now. Yes, I'm going to come to church. Yes, I want to go to youth. Yes, I'll even participate in some of these discipleship groups. We start. Yes, I'll do this. Yes, I'll do that. And all this. But, but I'm not going to fully commit. I'm not, I, I, some of us here today are even needing salvation. Or even in need of salvation today. And God is saying in His Word, How long will you halt between two opinions? If God be God, serve Him. If you serve the world, serve the world. If you serve Baal, serve Bell. God will only allow us to go so far before He will intercept us by His grace. Y'all like that? Brett Favre, y'all remember him? Man, did he throw a lot of interceptions. Peyton Manning, seems like when they were playing my team, Tom Brady and them. Man, Peyton Manning sure did throw a good interception every time I needed him to. The Atlanta Falcons, I don't even get started with that. I've done trashed them on the first day I was here. We're not going to go back to that again. You know, I, and, and for those of you that don't know, in football, that's when the quarterback's throwing the ball to his receiver. Somebody from the other team, like, jumps up and gets it, and then they're in control. How many of you need to say in your spirit, as you leap for joy in this moment, thinking about being rescued, how many of you wish that God would intercept you today? You're heading in the wrong direction. How many of you just wish Jesus would just put his hands up and say, today's the day, I'm rescuing you? Amen? Today's the day I'm going to save you. God has appointed these storms and these, these, this fish in the Bible. He appointed it to happen. Just as in the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for a time of, of this testing and everything. God appoints these things. Just as God appointed these things, I believe that God has appointed you to be here today. And it's by no accident that you're here. I want to ask you, are you running away from salvation? Are you a child of God, but you are still in a ship heading away from where you really need to be? As the man of the house, as the priest of your home. Maybe you've got a Jonah on board. Maybe today you realize I hadn't thought about that thing in my life. It's, it's, it might be bringing me down. I need to go ahead and get rid of that. The Holy Spirit will help you. So my last question to you, what are you going to do today? What decision will you make? Are you going to just keep heading the way you're heading? Because I want to promise you, with the authority of the, the template set in the book of Jonah, that you're probably heading for some tough stuff. Would you want to bring that on your family? Would you want to bring that on your church? Would you want to bring that on yourself? Why don't you submit to God now? Why don't you say, Lord, Lord, oh God, come where I am right now. I need you. I have made mistakes. God, forgive me, and I'll serve you. Lord, just make that your prayer today. Lord, I've got a Jonah on board, and he's fast asleep. He's as asleep as Connor Wimpy, and, and, and Connor just would not get out of bed. Where is he? Oh, man, that kid's hard to wake up. Man, Andy Bradshaw went back in there and rooster called like as loud as I've ever heard in my entire life. Like so loud we almost got complaints, okay? And Connor would not move. What is up with this kid? Maybe that's you today. 
God is literally pleading with you through the circumstances of your life, through the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. He's pleading with you. Wake up! And you won't budge. Oh, friend, you need to pray for God to rescue you. That's where we need to be today. And I want to say this. If there's somebody in here that needs to get saved, how long will you halt between two opinions? Make up your mind about which way you want to go. God will take you places you've never dreamed of. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Yeah, you're going to have persecution. Yeah, there's an enemy that's going to be out to get you like never before. But guess what? You're going to have the favor and the blessing and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And that is far greater than any trial you'll ever face. As the worship team comes, let us bow our heads in a word of prayer.